Hey, guys. Wow, that was loud. <laughs> so, praise God. All right. Tonight, next week, and then we're done with Refuge, back to Ziklag. Good to have everybody here tonight. Super excited about Gerard being with us this evening. I'll let James announce him here in a moment. Sean's not able to be with us tonight. A um, bunch of people have been asking about my mom, just so you know. Her surgery is next Wednesday. So if you just pray for my mom, probably be in the hospital for about a week afterwards. But they, um, uh, the tumor uh, has not grown. It's still there, but it's not in her lymph nodes. It hasn't metastasized. So, yeah, praise God. So, um, you know, I'm just telling what you what the, what the doctors are saying, obviously. Um, but uh, they, they're... they very confident that that they can uh, surgically remove the tumor and she won't have to deal with cancer again but we've uh, you know my prayer is that they open her up and they're like hey what happened here so praise god so we're going to pray along that line let the doctors do what the doctors do and let me do what we do and we'll go from there so yeah that's exactly right just see the lord work so excited about this this evening when gerard was gerard was here a couple of years ago i was just blown away and so when I asked James to put the speakers together, I was like, we got to get Gerard. So I'll shut up and I'm going to pray um, and uh, we'll let James do the introduction. And then uh, no music tonight, just just Gerard. And then we'll open up the floor um, and uh, then bring it home. Let's close or let's uh, open with a word of prayer. Uh, let's close with a word of prayer. <laughs> let's open with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for this day. What a day it's been. And um you know, from from this morning, Lord, seeing the six or seven people that were here in the building for morning prayer, and then the 50 people that were online with us, first thing. And then as Howard and I always talk, how many views were on there? Because I know, Lord, that not everybody gets to be on there the entire time. Over 100 people for morning prayer. And that's how the day began, Lord. And we're so thankful for that, 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 you know, right out of the chute, early will I rise and worship thee. And then a little bit ago, trying to find a place somewhere in this building where there weren't people where I could cut the daily devotional for tomorrow. That was next to impossible, Lord God. So much activity going on in this place. And so, Lord God, now that these guys are here in this room, gathered together for this evening to hear your word through Gerard. I just pray, pray again, Lord God, that you'll continue to strengthen the men of this church and that you'll continue to reach out to the men of this community. It's my prayer, Lord, that the guys in this room will see that you're asking them to be used as earthen vessels to revive men throughout this community. And I pray, James and I were there how many ever years ago that the original men's conference started. And there really were only about this amount of guys when we started. But next thing we knew, this entire room was filled. I think it was the second or third year that we had it. This entire room was filled. And so I'm excited to see what you birth from this group of men in this first round of refuge. I think about Acts 17, Lord, and how Paul looked out over the city of Athens and his spirit was stirred. I pray, Lord God, that these guys' hearts are stirred and they recognize that in this world, we've got to show what it means to be a man of God. We've got to show what it means to be a mighty man of valor. This isn't me coming down on the guys, Lord God, but we've got to recognize that we're not refugees. We're not hiding in a cave trying to save our lives until somehow you come back. No, God. I think about what Brian Loritz said. We're on the offensive not the defensive. In the authority of your name, Lord Jesus Christ, the confession that you are the Christ, the son of the living God, you said, Jesus, the gates of hell 
will not be able to overcome that truth. And so, God, we stand in that truth here tonight. And I pray that that is the message that comes to the men of this community, that they don't have to find themselves simply in a place of refuge, but they can rise up above the refuge of the cave of Adullam. They can rise up above the refuge of Ziklag, that they can stand in the throne room of the king victorious as mighty men of valor. Make that true, Lord God, in us. And may we carry that message throughout this community and beyond. Bless Gerard as he speaks tonight, Lord. Just so excited to have him here. I pray that we are all phenomenal listeners tonight, that we hear what word you've given this man of God to share with us. And that when he completes tonight, that we ask the questions that need to be asked and that filled with your word, we head back out into this community to advance your gospel. There's nothing else we have to do, as John Wesley said, but to save souls. Thank you for this tonight, Lord. We love and give you praise. It's in your precious name that we pray, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. James, if you didn't introduce our brother. How many of you were here two years ago when Gerard spoke? Anyone you would have been here for? Yeah. All right, all right. Well, good. He's going to be new to many of you, and that's good. I'm glad. You're going to be blessed by Gerard. I got to meet Gerard, um, I want to say, a handful of years now, right? A handful of years now in Denver. Um, Gerard is part of a ministry called uh, Dare to Share. He's part of many ministries, including uh, his own ministry that God has um, used him to raise up called Riot Starters. Um, but uh, met him through Dare to Share with Greg Steer, and um, was just taken by how awesome he was with our kids. Um, just right away, there was an instant connection with him, our students, and uh, we got to strike up conversations and kind of just felt um, just felt a kinship in Christ. And uh, so I thought to myself, man, if I ever uh, want to do some kind of ministry here at the church uh, where someone can speak on behalf of of our students and uh, and encourage our church in that way. Um, uh, Gerard's going to be the guy, and sure enough, that opportunity came two years ago uh, when we were uh, just doing our Youth Emphasis Sunday, and I couldn't think of no better person than Gerard to speak. Um, he's from uh, originally from Tampa and, uh, and uh, now resides in Memphis, and uh, the city has his heart. I'm going to let him share all about that, share a little bit more about his ministries. He is a faithful servant of the King. Um, he has a heart uh, for the inner city students. Um, that he ministers to. He has a heart to bring pastors together. Um, and again, I'm not going to share too much, but um, he sits down. Uh, one of the challenges that God gave him was to sit down with a, a senior pastor in his community, in his city, um, once a week to bring unity, to create a movement of God in the city. Um, he's not trying to raise up his ministry, his name. He truly is trying to raise up the name of Jesus Christ. I've known him for quite a bit now, and uh, since then, and we've spent a lot of time together since then, not a ton, but, but enough, I would say enough, and, um, and uh, I'm just blessed uh, to call him a friend, and I'm blessed that you're going to get um, to share uh, in what God has put on his heart and the ministry God's given him, amen? Amen. amen. So let's welcome Gerard. All right, all right. Man, I feel like, uh, man, I feel like we got this this, this, this meeting of, of people up in the upper room together. And so, uh, man, we're going to have a good time tonight. Um, but I, I feel like I love, uh, man, can we give God honor for uh, Kevin and for, for James uh, just as our leaders? Um, I'm always encouraged when I talk to them because I, I just leave saying, man, those guys, they just get it. Right. I don't have to come and try to, you know, imp like I'm leaving like, man, they get it. I don't feel crazy for how I feel and what I see across the country. And so uh, I thank God for him and I thank God uh, for this guy. They they uh, they really are, are amazing leaders. And so as a young leader, I'm always watching them like, what are they doing next? Because I want to do the same. Right. Look, um, it, it was so crazy listening to to Kevin's prayer. I was touching and agreeing with him as he was praying. Uh, what I'm going to share tonight is, is really, uh, man, the practical steps of his prayer. Um, he was praying that you guys would begin to mobilize and take this city uh, with kingdom mindset, with kingdom focus, with laser-like focus 
for this kingdom. I even was talking to him earlier. He was like, I, I want to move this, this men's event to other churches. There's not a lot of pastors that say that because they want it to be about their church. But this young man, he's a young man, right? He's like, no, I, I want to begin to move this to other churches, and I'm telling you, that is how we're going to mobilize it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about that um, uh, tonight. I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, again, I'm from Tampa, Florida. I uh, love the Tampa Bay Bucks. We're back in the basement this year. Tom has left us. Um, <laughs> But it's okay uh, because, uh, man, we still rocking with him, man. So, uh, but let's, let's just dive right into this, man. I hope you guys are, are note takers. Uh, I know sometimes, you know, we're tough guys, but I'm telling you, there's going to be some things I'm going to say that you may not remember, but I want you to run home and tell your wives about what we talk here tonight, tell your homies about what we talk, because I think it's going to be important for us as we get ready to launch a movement in Morgantown. Y'all with me? Let's pray. Uh, God, you are faithful. You're good. God, they don't come to hear from me, but they do come to hear from you. So I say, speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Uh, so I, I, I was thinking about this work that you guys are doing here, um, this men's summit, and it's impacting uh, this community around you. And I thought about, you know, what I really want to share through these. Uh, and what you guys are doing is impacting each other through these life-on-life uh, relationships, and uh, it kind of reminded me of, of Jesus and Peter, right? Kind of reminded me uh, of Jesus and Peter, and um, here you have these two different people. You have the Messiah, uh, and you have Peter. Uh, Peter, this, this hot, angry, he's a, uh, just a loud, you know, kind of guy. Reminds me of my grandfather. My grandfather, uh, and Peter was a fisherman. Like my grandfather, my grandfather uh, was a fisherman. But my grandfather was a cusser, right? He was a cusser. And, uh, and like the people of Peter's day, like these fishermen were like manly men, like they, uh, they, were, they were hot-tempered, um, and they had used vulgar language, language right? Kind of reminds me of some of the pastors, like where I'm from, like, you know, they just got this, you know, hot temper. some of them cuss a lot, you know. Um, but then I think about this, this guy, this Peter, um, who is technically, they are fishermen, they're fishers of men, uh, but unique to, in spite of who Peter was, God said, I'm going to use that guy, right? I'm going to use him. Uh, I'm going to grow him as a mature follower. His failures, it, it, you, we know Peter had several failures, but they did not discredit what God wanted to really do with him. They did not discredit that. It's so much so that Jesus said, upon this rock, upon your faith, I'm going to build my church. I'm going to build my church. And so I, I really think about this life-on-life -life dynamic that resulted in a relationship that was contagious. And so tonight I want to talk about how do we create contagious movements? How do we create contagious movements? And I truly believe that contagious movements are created through contagious relationships. They're created through contagious relationships. Peter takes this transformative message of the gospel to the Gentiles, right, of people who many said should not have heard it, did not qualify to receive it, but he takes his message to these Gentiles and, and really begin to replicate the mission that Jesus showed him. And so I think about um, those relationships, and those relationships, these are the relationships that I truly believe, and we all know this to be true, that are really truly going to impact this world that is around us. They're impactful, they're purposeful, um, they're replicative, right? Look at, look at what Robert Coleman said. Robert Coleman said this. He says, what really counts in the ultimate perpetuation of our work, of our work is the faithfulness with which our converts go and make leaders out of their converts, not simply more followers. You see, this idea of us just making converts is not ultimately what Jesus wanted. Jesus wanted more leaders. I want, more, I want more disciples, right? Not just more people making decisions. I want people that are really to lead and follow and take this mission to the uttermost parts of the, wo the world. Then he says this. He says, the test of any work of evangelism, watch this, thus is not what is seen at the moment. It's not what is seen at the moment or in the conference report that we read, no, but in the effectiveness which, which the work continues, where? In the next generation. How are we going to create contagious movements? we got to begin to lean into more contagious relationships. 
Look, I, I don't know who you guys want to be like, but there are about two guys that I wanted to be like in my life. The first one, do not judge me. The first one, I wanted to be like Hulk Hogan. <laughs> Anybody else want to judge like me? Like, like, honestly, let's be honest. Like, we just, we just all wanted to put the shirt on and just rip the shirt off and just do that thing. Like, I was a kid. I just wanted to walk around the house, find me the oldest T-shirt I could, and go in front of my mom and just be like, Rah! I just wanted to do that, right? I wanted to be like Hulk Hogan. But the other person that I wanted to be like was my cousin Bernard. Now, Bernard was crazy. I mean, this guy was crazy. He literally would jump off of houses. I mean, he would, he would literally run from the police just for fun. I mean, my cousin was insane. I, here's a picture of him. Here's a picture of my cousin right here. I hope the media team will help me out. Uh, this is a picture of my, he, he is crazy. This is what he wore to my wedding. This is my cousin, right? And, and, and my cousin just had this, he was crazy. He, was, he just did crazy stuff. I mean, I seen him jump a chain link fence, a six foot fence in one leap. Just, I mean, he was athletic. He was a wrestler. Like my, I wanted to be just like my cousin. My cousin had a little, had some issues. He had some issues, right? And one day he wakes up, we grew up in Tampa, Florida. He wakes up and he says, I'm gonna make you tough. And I'm like, I feel like I'm pretty tough, man. I'm 10 years old, but I'm, I feel like I'm tough. And he says, he says, I'm going to make you tough. And he begins to walk me around the community, finding people for me to fight. I'm like, this dude is crazy. And, and there was one kid, there's this bully in our, in our neighborhood by the name of Raby. I do not know why they call him Raby. I don't know if they enjoy dogs, but his name was Raby. And Raby was kind of like the, the city bully, the, the, the community bully. And so, so he says, listen, if you beat Raby, I promise you, you're going to be tough. You're going to be ready for the streets of Tampa. And I'm just like, I don't know. I really want to fight this guy. Raby is a pretty big kid. He's like, no, if you do not fight this guy, you'll be running for the rest of your life. So I'm like, this is my cousin. He tells me to do it. I'm going to do it. And so I go, and, and we go to this kid's house, and, and, and Raby, his sister comes out, I'm like, what y'all are? And I got this look in my eye, I'm to my, like, I'm twitching, like, I'm ready to get it, give it to this kid. I look like Thriller, you know, I'm like, yo, like, we finna get it on, man, we finna do this. Raby comes out the house, and he sees my look in my eye, and I start chasing him, and Raby lets out this shriek that Mariah Carey would be envious of. <laughs> and I stop, and I'm like, this kid ain't that He's not that tough. But what my cousin showed me is that, man, there are some things that we're going to have to face head on. There are some things that are going to come in our lives that, man, you can't, do, can't run no more. I really believe in this time in the life of the church that there is a level of boldness that is available for the believer. There, there, there isn't this, this idea of cowering back. No, this is our time to, to, to charge ahead. There is a level of boldness, and it is available if we are willing to receive it. So I, I think about, I think about this, this moment. One thing that my cousin showed me is that true contagious relationships, they start with a source. You see, my cousin, I would have did anything for him. He was a strong leader. I mean, he gave me crazy advice. I mean, he would give me advice like, listen, cuz, listen, I, I, don't buy your girl anything. Don't give her a ring. Don't, get, don't give her a ring because she'll lose that ring. Give her a tree because she can watch that tree grow. Trust me, my wife would not have appreciated a tree but this is the way he thought. I mean, he just had these crazy things. But, but he had a, this, it's amazing. He just was this, this thoughtful person. He cared about me. And my cousin, although many people may say, hey, man, your cousin was leading you down the wrong road. I remember one day I wanted to be just like him. My cousin was a part of a gang. He was in the drugs. And one day I was headed out the door behind him because I wanted to be just like him. He turned around and he looked at me and he said, no, no, no. You lead the streets to me. You going to college. You see, I believe my cousin saw the purpose in me even if he didn't see the purpose in his own life. And it takes a contagious leader to be able to say, hey, there is something more inside of each and every one of us. 
And I think tonight, one of the things I want to begin to challenge us is that for us, that contagious leader is Jesus. He is that source. The gospel message has the ability to affect everyone that is willing to receive it. So here's what you need to know tonight. God has called us to contagious relationships that are radically going to transform our culture. That was the goal. That was always the goal. His plan all along in Ephesians 3 and 10 says his plan all along was for us to amaze culture. It was to amaze heaven. In Ephesians 3 and 8, can you help me out, media team? Ephesians 3 and 8 says this, Though I am the least deserving of all God's people, the, he graciously gave me the privilege of telling the Gentiles about the endless treasures available to them in Christ. Next verse. I was chosen to explain to everyone this mysterious plan that God, the creator of all things, had kept secret from the beginning. Next verse. God's purpose in all of this was to use the church to display his wisdom in his rich variety to all unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Did you see that? God's plan is to use us to even amaze heaven. Like, God, how, how did you change Morgantown with these common men? Like, how did you use these frail individuals to create this massive movement? It was always his plan to use the least of these to change the world. And he wants to do that again through us. But I often wonder this. How will we treat this idea of contagious relationships? How will we pursue this need to, to develop, creation, create cr 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 contagious relationships? Or maybe this. Can we at least consider and admit that we haven't really been that contagious? You see, tonight I want to I want to I want to help you with something. I want to help that we begin to know, and we all know this to be true, and it can be difficult. We all know this to be true, and maybe 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 all of us are sitting here. We know that it is difficult to create contagious relationship, and here's why: because we love independence. We like independence. Our world is built on independence. We like our culture this way. Listen, I was talking to a student the other day, and I said, what's your favorite team? He said, I don't have a favorite team. Like, what do you mean you don't have a favorite team? I just follow players. Like, we don't even have people that have real teams. Like, they, I, know, I know James does. He followed the Jets for years. They've been terrible for years, but, but he still <laughs> followed them. But now we live in a culture, we live in a culture where, like, we don't even want to follow teams because we like our independence. That's why fantasy football is so real, because we get to choose our players. We like independence. We love our independence. But John 15 says, if you would abide in me, dependence, he says, I'm bringing the fruit. You see, we got to begin to ask ourselves, but what we see most in our churches is independence, our country. But here's what I know. God has called us to be dependent on the relationships in the body of Christ. We need each other. We are part of a body. We are a headless church without God. But we need to ask ourselves, are we willing to be dependent on each other to create this contagious movement? That's why I love so much what Kevin said. Like, I know this cannot just be about kingdom. Church. <laughs> it has to be about all the others if we're really going to create a movement that is going to be a nightmare for the darkness of hell. Even more so, I know this to be true, that we have an adversary. We have an adversary, and he knows that his plan, his plan is to keep us divided. His plan is to be a deceiver. His plan is to make sure that just as Jesus prayed that we would be united, is to keep us from being united. You see, he knows that the way of the kingdom is unity. He knows that. Can, can I tell you guys something? Kingdom is really, and I love that your guy's name is kingdom. Kingdom is really a governmental principle. The kingdom of God is a governmental term. You see, when, when Jesus talked about the kingdom of God, he was presenting a new change in government. That's why the Bible says the government should be on his shoulders. He was presenting this idea because we understand that in government, right, in government that there is another pattern or another culture, another way of doing things. And so Jesus says, I want to create a culture where the, where the culture is dependence on me and on each other. 
It's a kingdom. It's, it, it's a governmental term. You see, I, I love this about the enemy spends time not, not to, keep us, to keep us from kingdom. What he does is try to keep us religious. Miles Moran so said, this, said this, he said, he said the coming, in the coming future, our conflict isn't going to be with sin. Our conflict is going to be with Christianity and kingdom. Our conflict isn't going to be with, with sin. Our conflict is going to be with the Christian religion against the kingdom of God. You see, we got to ask ourselves that, that, that there is a kingdom, there is a way that God wants us to live. But I'm glad tonight. I'm glad tonight that we get to do this. And so I want to tell you, there's going to be three things that I want to share with you tonight on how we're going to create this contagious movement. The first thing is the gospel message has to be clear. The core has to be committed. That's why I love that we have this, this, this small group of guys. The core has to be committed first. The core has to be committed, and lastly, the core needs to be consecrated. The gospel has to be clear, the core needs to be committed, and the core needs to be consecrated. And so I want us to look at Acts chapter 19 really quick. I want us to look at Acts chapter 19 real quick. If you've got your Bibles, turn there. I want to read this with you. Acts chapter 19. How do we make moves towards contagious relationships that can start movement? I got good news that in our text, Paul shows us how we begin to do that. He shows us how do we begin to do that. The first verse says this. It says, and while Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions until he reached Ephesus on the coast where he found several believers. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed, he asked them? No, they replied, we haven't even heard there is a Holy Spirit. Then what baptism did you experience, he asked? And they replied, the baptism of John. Next verse. Paul said, John's baptism called for repentance from sin, but John himself told the people to believe in the one who would come later, meaning Jesus. Next verse. As soon as they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus See, here the message of the gospel was clear. These people here, they, they, they had essentially been living under an incomplete gospel, right? And Jesus comes, Paul comes and says, no, 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 hey, they, 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 now you put your faith in Jesus and him alone, and then that is going to begin to change the areas, begin to change the way that you begin to see your communities. You see, we, see, we have believers that are saved, but they don't understand the mission of the kingdom. They have believers that are saved but don't truly understand that there is a mission in the kingdom. And we're going to talk about that. But once they heard, they immediately respond to the gospel message. If I can be honest, I saw this happen in our, our own church. As a youth pastor, I, you know, we didn't have an issue getting kids, right? But we knew something was missing. Right. And some of you know my story and I'll share a little bit about it. But and, and, and you, Memphis, it has its challenges like every other inner cities, you know, has its challenges. There's thirty three hundred churches in Memphis. But there's two hundred and fifty recognized gangs in our city. Our city is top five in the nation in crime and we ain't number five. We number one. In violent crimes. And I have to ask myself, like, yo, how is it that we have all the body of Christ in our city, but we still rank in the top in the nation? Could it be that they're missing the mission? And so we begin to ask ourselves, what is it that we need to, what is it that we need to do? And, and we recognize that the games that we were playing with our kids, they were fun and they were cool, but it was not beginning to deal with the issues and the brokenness and the hopelessness that our students were facing. I mean, that was a good, you know, a good break from what was going on. But when they left our ministry, they were going back to these dilapidated areas. They was going back to violence. They was going back to crime. What was missing in our ministry? We recognized that it had to be the gospel. One incident happened in our church where uh, a white kid, a black cop, a black, a white cop shot a black kid on the front lawn of our church. Regular traffic stop. 
And this was at a time in our, in our nation where riots were breaking out all over our nation over police brutality. And, and this, this kid is, is stopped, and, and, and the police, they wrestle, and the, and the police kills this kid. Many of our students knew this kid. I ride up the next morning, and all I see is yellow tape, and I'm, going, I'm pulling up, and the police say, hey, you can't come in here. I say, but I work here. He says, not today, you don't. And I see the body laying over there on the front lawn of our youth campus. And in that time, there were, there were other ministries that were trying to recruit our students to go riot. They're recruiting our students to go tear our city down. Because here's what I do know, and you may know this too, a riot is a response. Whether we like it or not, a riot is a response. Martin Luther King said, the riot is simply the voice of the unheard. And a riot is a response, but I truly believe that the kingdom of God, the government of God said that there needs to be another response. A riot is a response, but God said there should be another response. And so we begin to ask God, what is the response? How do we begin to respond? Because our city is already racially divided, but how do we begin to lean into and speak into this area? And we begin to pray and ask God, what should we do? And I say, God, maybe we should start a riot. And he says, you can't start a riot, but it's got to be a righteous riot. 2 Corinthians 10 and 4 says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds. And we take captive every thought that sets itself up against the true and living knowledge of God, and we make it obey Christ. We got a weapon. It ain't no gun. It ain't no bottles, but we have a weapon, and that weapon is the power of prayer. And we begin to train those young men, those young women in the power of prayer and in the power of the gospel. And we say, listen, here's your challenge. We're going to challenge you every single week, every single week to go into your schools and be praying. Every single Wednesday, we want you to go into your schools and pray. And what happened? Those kids begin to get jacked up. They begin to like, yo, we're going to do this. We're going to change our communities with the power of prayer and the power of gospel. And they got hype. At one particular school, they say, hey, listen, we're going to do this. And then the administration gets in and they say, wait a minute, hold on. If you do this, we're going to suspend. If you're one minute late, we're going to suspend all of you. And those students came to me the next day as a group. They said, hey, PJ, they say, if we pray, they're going to suspend us all. I'm like, what do y'all want to do? They was like, oh, we praying. We just want to let you know what's going on. <laughs> Because they understood that there was a mission in the kingdom of God that there should be another response. The riot is a response, but we're going to start a righteous riot. We're going to infuse our schools with prayer. We're going to infuse our schools with the message of the gospel. We have a mission. The next day, 500 students show up to this school to pray. They begin to pray, and somebody should have had their eyes closed, but they took out a phone and begin to record this thing, and it goes viral. The Memphis Grizzlies are shared, retweeting it. The, the, the news is resharing it. And we were looking for a response for our city, but God put a response on display for the whole world to see. You see, this is the mission of the kingdom of God. The gospel message has to be clear. And when it is clear, the core will take it, and they will run with it. But it's got to be clear. Oftentimes what I see when people put, preach the gospel, that they put things beside the gospel. They put baptism beside the gospel, or they put works beside the gospel. And can I tell you something? That ain't the gospel. The Bible says that if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll do what? I'll draw all men unto me, right? It's Jesus and him alone. It's him alone. And, 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 and what I, I recognize that be, I, was, I was at the hotel and, 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 and I have my, the lady gives me my key card, and uh, I get up to my room, and I get there, and my key card doesn't work. So I'm like, yo, like, I'm tired. Like, I, I, don't want, I don't need this drama right now, right? So I go back down, and I say, hey, lady, you gave me a bad key card. She says, are you sure? I'm like, yeah. She says, where'd you put your key card? I said, I put it in my pocket. She said, what was in your pocket? I said, my phone. She said, there it is. She says, you put your key card next to your phone, and it withdrew the power from the key card. Anytime we put anything next to the cross, anytime we put anything next to Jesus, it withdraws the power away from what he is only only he can do. The message has to be clear, and it has to be on the person of Jesus and him alone. You see, I know this to be true. 
because I never heard the gospel until about 12 years ago. First time. Went, been going to church. I heard the Easter message. I heard it. But I had never heard the clear message of the gospel. And unlike most people, when I finally heard it, I wasn't happy. I wasn't excited. I was mad. Because they were telling me how to live a life like this instead of trusting in Jesus alone. Instead of trusting in that he had already done the work on the cross for me and I need to put my trust in him. And when I heard that message, when I heard that message, I called my mom and I said, Mom, you got to tell me, did you know this? <laughs> like, be real with me. Did you know this? And my mom told me, she said, I didn't know that either. And so on the phone, I shared the gospel with my mom for the first time and she put her faith in Jesus Christ. <laughs> right? Man, the gospel, listen, when you get this thing, it will change generational curses in your family. I know that to be true. But the message got to be clear. It's got to be Jesus and him alone. The second thing that we got to do if we're going to have a contagious movement, the second thing we got to do is that the core is committed. The core is committed. Let's go back to our text. Let's go back to our text. It says here, it says in Acts 19, 19, it says, Paul is teaching and training every day in the Areopagus for two years straight. Let's go to verse 9. Go to verse 9 for me. Go to verse 9. It said, then Paul went to the synagogue and he preached. Oh, uh, go back. Verse 8. We can take that. We go to verse 8. Then it said, Paul in the synagogue and preached boldly for the next three months, arguing, right? He's arguing per persuasively about the what? The kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. Can I, I, I got to get us to get this, this, this governmental idea about the kingdom of God. You see, there, there are literally 30 to 40 monarchies that are still in our world today. And in those monarchies, they have kings and lords and queens, and they understand when the king speaks, that's it. And so when the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of God, Jesus is our He's our king, and when the king speaks, that should be it. Amen. But oftentimes, we live in a culture, we live in the Western culture where we have a president, and when the president says something, we say, hey, let's vote on it. Let's vote. Because we don't understand the, 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 the kingdom of God, because we try to apply the Bible to our natural context. But the kingdom of God is like, no, Jesus says, no, I want you to love your enemy. No, the real enemy that hates you, I want you to love, in my kingdom, I want you to love that person. The kingdom, the king has spoken, that should be it. But because we are looking at, at our Western culture, we truly believe that, hey, man, listen, we are instead, we are treating Jesus like a president and not a king. Right. You see, when Jesus says something now, we're like, hey, could we vote on that? Love your enemy. Well, which enemy? Serve the, serve the homeless. Well, wait a minute. I've, served, I've given him $2 last week. We, we, we want to vote. Jesus is our king, not our president. And Paul is saying, listen, I need to begin to persuasively what I'm trying to do. I want to persuade you about the kingdom of God, the culture. Jesus is our king and not our president. We don't get to vote. You see here, the core is committed in this idea of the kingdom of God. But then it says, it says, next verse, can we go to the next verse? It says, but some became stubborn. That's what we do, right? Some became stubborn. We want to vote on that. Rejecting his message and publicly speaking against the way. So Paul left the synagogue and took the believers with him. Then he held daily discussions at the lecture hall of tiredness. He says, so he left them. Go back. He left them. He said, hey, this church, I'm trying to teach to the people in the church, and the churches, they want to vote on what God says. They want to vote on what God has already settled in the Bible. They want to vote on what this is. And God is like, wait a minute, hold on. No, I've already spoken. That's it. That's right. Paul says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the core. Just give me a little bit of y'all. 
I just want to get the people who really want to be a part of this kingdom of God, this new way of how we're going to see this thing, this new way of how we're going to love people, this new way of how we're going to infuse. He says, give me the core. And what he did was, the next verse, he says this. He goes to the next verse, and he says, the next two years, so people throughout, the, he, pro- he trained them for the next two years so that people throughout the province of Asia, you guys know how big Asia is, the province of Asia, both Jews and Greeks heard the word of the Lord. Paul commits the core to this message of the kingdom of God. He begins to commit this, this, this amazing movement. That, and and what, was so, what was so cool about it is that it says that it caused them to reach all the Jews and Greece in the province of Asia. Can you imagine how committed these leaders were to reach a whole province? How committed do you have to be to reach all? How faithful do you have to be to reach all of Morgantown? How committed will you have to be to reach the whole university? The Bible says Paul was committed to reach the whole community. Are we committed to the mission of equipping? Or have we become numb to the idea? Me and James were talking about this, this idea of, 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 of being in ministry for so long that we just become desensitized and that our fire has just gone down. I'm a city boy, so I didn't really understand this idea until I lit my, 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 my fire pit out, outside of me and my daughter was sitting outside and she says, Dad, she says, listen, the, the fire's going out. We need to put some more wood on the fire. I say, no. One of my country friends told me, all you got to do is just Stir it up. And whew, the fire goes up again. Are we committed? Are we committed to the mission of being faithful? Are we committed to, to what it means to truly ch- go into all families, all neighborhoods, all people? Matthew 9 says Jesus went into all. No matter the color, no matter the creed, are we going to be committed to go to all? Because that's what it's going to take to get all. You can't say, yeah, I want all, and we go to the third. No, we, we want all. If we're going to, tra- if we're going to change this community, we got to go to all. And we got to search ourselves to ask ourselves, are we committed? Here, here's what I think about this. Are we committed to making disciples? Can I give you my, def- my, de- my definition of disciples? I believe disciples are this. Disciples is the kind of person that Jesus would be. A disciple is simply the kind of person that Jesus would be. What well, can I ask you a question? Are you the kind of person that you would follow? Are you the kind of person that you would say, hey, listen, come follow me because I, 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 I'm committed to this mission. Are you the kind of person that you would follow? You see, we need spiritually vibrant leaders. I'm a youth pastor and a young adult pastor, so I always have to come when I'm in rooms like this. I have to challenge us to say, hey, this generation is looking for spiritually vibrant leaders. What does that simply mean? They are saying, because we are all saying it, hey, we want you guys to love Jesus. We want you guys to be madly in love with Christ. Listen, would you love Jesus? Would you be on fire for God again? And my question to tell them to ask you guys is, do you still love him? Is he still good in your life? Do you still get up in the morning and say, God, man, blessed be the name of the Lord. Man, let all my body, let everything that is in me bless God. Are you still excited about that? Because that's what this generation needs. You see, what Paul did was he challenged them. He committed the core. How we're going to create? How we're going to create contagious movements? We have to challenge the community around us. There's this concept in, in building community. There, there's this concept called over adapting and under adapting. You see, over adapting when you're trying to build community, when you're trying to start movements, is un- over adapting simply is this: when when you are so afraid to to offend. When we're afraid to challenge, when we're afraid that we, we, essentially, we essentially begin to take on the, the idols of the culture. 
because we're over adapting. But then you have the extreme where they under adapt, where it's like, uh-uh, nope. And what the Bible says, not going to do it. We're going to be the same way we were when we were in 1955, and this is going to be how it's going to be for here until Jesus returns. We under adapt. And now our culture becomes the idol. You see, you're not going to create contagious movements like that. You got to find the space where the gospel is leading us. The gospel has to lead us in all things where it has to be say, hey, I love you, but hey, can I challenge you in that right there? And, and, but it also has to be able to say, hey, man, I love you, but you know what? I'm going to give you grace right here. See, Paul challenged them. He didn't just give them a whole bunch of great information. He challenged them. He challenged them in making sure that they did not simply just stick with the status quo. He said, listen, we're trying to start a movement. And that's going to be challenged. So here's what I know. Here's what I know. I've seen this in my own life. I've seen this. Our students... During the pandemic, we could not be in churches. I don't know how long you guys, but we literally did not get back into churches until the earlier part of, this, of, of last year, of last year, 2022. We could not get in churches just because of the, 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 the health, the, 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 the access to, to medical treatment. They couldn't, we couldn't get in churches because the, the COVID numbers were so high in our area. So we could not meet, but that core was committed they were committed to say, no, 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 this city needs to hear the gospel. So what are we going to do? Let's just meet in the park. And pastor, all we need is worship, the gospel, and hot dogs. <laughs> they were committed. They were com the core was committed. This, this wasn't me. They said, listen, we got to share the gospel. This community needs to hear a message of hope. So all we need is worship. The gospel and hot dogs. And we did it. Every single Wednesday, we would go out there with worship, hot dogs, and the gospel. Every single Wednesday. And we didn't know who was going to come. We just knew that we were going to be there. And people began to come out of their apartment communities. They began to come. Even students began to come, and they had their guns on their belts. But what was so dope is some of our leaders would go up to those students and say, hey, hey, could you take your gun back home and then come back and get a hot dog? Can I tell you what happened? They would take their guns back home and come back and get a hot dog because the core was committed. They were committed to a mission. So much so that we were in that park every single Wednesday. Every single Wednesday. And I always ask myself, like, you know, I, I saw this movie. We didn't know who was going to show up, but we knew that we were going to be there. I watched this movie during the pandemic because I had time. I had never seen this movie. Have you guys seen this movie called The Field of Dreams? I, I had never seen this movie. So I'm sitting there, and they're literally building this, this baseball field for some ghosts to come play. And he kept saying what? If you build it, they will come. And he kept saying that. If you build it, they will come. And I started thinking about that, and I was like, that's not true. I built a lot of things and students haven't come to it. I built a lot of events and students haven't come to it. I built a lot of things in this community, ain't trying to see it, but here's what I found. If you stay, they will come. If you plant your flag and you say, I'm not leaving until every heart hears the message of the gospel. I'm not leaving until every white, black, brown, purple kid hears the message. I'm going to plant my gospel flag, and we ain't going to move until every, every, every heart hears a message of hope, a message of deliverance, a message of healing, a message of freedom. We're not moving until we say what God told us to say. If you stay they will come. If we want to start a movement, it's not about how much we build. It's about how they know, listen, kingdom is going to be there. See, Paul committed those leaders to that movement. So much so, we saw a young man that, that came by one Wednesday night. We were out there, and he was, he was am I good on time? Huh. And, 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 and he was out there, and he says, he drives up while we're out there on Wednesday night. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We're out there on Wednesday night, and he pulls up, 
and he makes a beeline for me. He says, hey, man, I, I heard you guys outside, right? What did he say? Hebrews outside the camp, right? He, 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 he comes up and he says, man, I'm looking for this black magic shop. My friend told me that if I can get to this black magic shop, that I can get me some crystals and some black magic cards, and they were going to give me some peace because I feel like ending my life. He said that there's this black magic shop around the corner from your church, and that if I can get just to that shop, I can get me some peace. And I'm not all together in my mind. I'm not, I'm not a sane person. So I said to him, listen, you can get the taste of the rainbow in crystals, but they ain't going to give you no peace. But can I tell you about Jesus? He will give you peace that this world cannot give and it cannot take away. And so he began to come every Wednesday because we had planted our flag and we were going to be there. Every Wednesday he begins to come. He begins to come. And one night he comes up to me with this big smile on his face as if a whole weight had been lifted off of his shoulders. I'm like, man, why are you smiling? He's like, man, I've never felt like this in my life. I just, I just feel, man, so free. And I'm like, man, that's the gospel. And he says, man, you sure this guy you're talking about can give me peace? I'm like, man, if you would just trust in him and him alone, not this world, but trust just in him and him alone, not yourself, in him and him alone, he will give you peace that passes all understanding. In that part, Tevin made and put his faith in Christ for the first time that night, in that part that night. And then he began, he said, wait a minute, I, I want to get baptized. I'm like, now you know baptism doesn't save you. He says, I know, but I just, I, just, I just feel like I need to make this official. And I say, it's already official. I know, but I, just, it's, I need it for me. I say, but we can't get into the church. It's closed. He says, I want to be baptized. And I want you to do it. So I call my pastor. I say, hey, man, I'm out here in the neighborhood. We don't call the hood. We call it the neighborhood. <laughs> I'm out here in the neighborhood. We got to open that church. And so he sends an elder. Me and this elder take this kid and we baptize him, man, on a Sunday morning. And Tevin is now a gospel rapper in our city, man. Give God praise for that. What am I saying? What am I saying? When we commit the core... I don't think it was because of the hot dogs. I would like to think so that they kept coming. I think it was because that core was committed to saying we're going to plant our flag and we ain't moving. Amen. We ain't moving. Not only were they committed, but I think it takes a committed leader. Paul was a committed leader. So much so, uh, verse 13, verse 13, can you show that verse Verse 13, he said, a group of Jews was traveling from town to town, casting out evil spirits. They tried to use the name of the Lord Jesus in their incantation, saying, I command you in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, to come out. Next verse. Seven sons of Sceva, leading priests, were doing this. Next verse. But one time when they tried it, the evil spirit replied, I know Jesus, and I know Paul, but who are you? Stop right there. Paul was committed. Paul was so committed that demons began to speak up for Paul. And I ask myself a question. How committed do you have to be for Satan to start speaking up your name? I mean, I mean how committed do you have to be for demons to even say, hey, wait a minute. Don't mess with those men at kingdom because they are committed to the mission. How committed do you have to be to become synonymous with the mission? I don't know, but I want to be that. I want to be so committed to this mission that God has called us to that when they see me coming to the school, they say, hey man, there go that guy, and I promise you, he's going to start talking about Jesus. I don't know how committed you have to be, but I truly believe that that is what God is calling for this committed core to say, how committed are we going to be so that we are synonymous with the mission of the kingdom? So much so that even demons know, I know that they're serious. So much so that, watch this, it said that he, he, didn't know, he didn't name the seven sons of Sceva. He just named the people who were the real thing. Even the enemy knows imposters. See, we got to ask ourselves, how committed are we going to be? Can you imagine? Can you imagine being so faithful that even the gang members know what you're doing? 
Can you imagine being so faithful that the church down the street says, hey, man, I don't know what you guys are doing, but I want to be a part of that. Can you imagine being that faithful? Like, that's what God is calling us to. You have to commit the core. And then the last thing was this. We got to be consecrate the core. We got to consecrate the core. I love that Paul was faithful. Paul was so committed in sharing that message of the gospel. But can I be honest with you? Paul, was a, he, he didn't have anything more different than any of us have. He didn't have any more power than any of you have. He didn't have any more power than I have. But Paul was simply faithful. Faithfulness. Maybe we don't see more contagious relationships or, or more contagious movements because we grow weary in our faithfulness. If we can be honest. You see, the Bible, God tells us, he says to be fruitful and multiply. But oftentimes what I see in most churches, they want the multiplication before they want to be fruitful. We want the, we want the, the all, the, all the towns. We want the big crowds and we want this. But God says, no, be fruitful here first. You be fruitful and I'll multiply that. You see, what I learned is fruitfulness takes faithfulness. You see, God is not just blessing desire in this season. He's blessing diligence. Will you be diligent? The Bible says God is a rewarder of them that would diligently, come on, seek him. Everybody want to do, I, I have a desire to do this. I have a desire to do that. God said, that's great. But will you be diligent? How are we going to start this movement? We got to be diligent. Sometimes in the neighborhood, many of the people see churches coming because they only come during Christmas, Easter, and Mother's Day, and maybe Thanksgiving. They call them the turkey people. <laughs> they come to turkey people. It's the holidays, and I get it. It's a layup for churches. But those people are asking this question now. Where are you guys the other 363 days of the year? Appreciate the bike. Appreciate the tricycle. But I need some hope. And Paul, he begins to consecrate the leaders. It's the last point I want to I wanna challenge us. Why is this important? Why is this important? Because when we are committed to being faithful in equipping a generation, when we're committed to it, I truly believe that we were going to begin to see the fruit of the gospel revealed in all of culture. I, I told the leaders in our city, I thank God that we got a new mayor. I thank God that we got a new police chief, but that ain't going to change crime in our city. Right. We need policy and prayer. We need a new politician and prayer. We need Jesus. We need the gospel that is infused in people to be the leaders of our city that are going to make decisions based on the kingdom of God, that are going to rule based on the leaders, the kingdom of God. That's what we need. When we begin to equip the leader, the committed core, and we send them out into the different areas that we are engaging and the different areas that we influence, we are going to see the kingdom culture as it is in heaven on earth. That's what we're going to see. But before we do that, we got to commit. We got to consecrate the, com the core. We got to consecrate the core. The Bible says that Paul, he didn't go to Ephesus this time. He didn't go to Ephesus. He wanted to complete his Nazarite vow, which is a, a Jewish custom. But he comes this time, and the Bible says that, that once they saw what happened to the seven sons of Sceva, it says some of the believers came confessing. Their sins came confessing their own demonic practices. I just always missed it. It said the believers were dabbling in demonic things. And I'm sure that that's not happening here, but can I be honest? There are some things that we might need to confess tonight. So much so that it says some other people brought their, their incantation books and their, their amulets and, and all the different things, and they started a massive bonfire. Now, I'm from youth ministry, and we love a good bonfire. But this was a big, expensive bonfire. 
And what I believe what was happening in that moment is that they began to say they had found something more valuable than all of their incantation books. They had found something more valuable than all of their spells and all of their secrets. They, they had found that the message of the gospel was the power unto salvation. But he consecrated that core. Here's my question to you tonight. Could it be? Could you at least consider that the things that may separate us from causing this movement could be our busyness, could be our pride. The thing that we have valued above all things, the thing that we have valued, it could be our business. We have to consecrate the core. And I know we're in a room full of pastors and leaders and, and ministry leaders, but, cannot, but can we be honest, can we be honest that there is a distance that we have to begin to ask ourselves, that we have to begin to ask ourselves, what have you refused to burn that has held value over Jesus? What, you have, what have you refused to burn that just might, watch this, compromise the movement? Is it our procrastination? Is it I still wanting to vote when Jesus said go? Well, maybe we should go like this. God said, no, I said go. We'll figure the rest out on the way. I want to share this, and I'm, and I'm done. There was an opportunity I had to go. My friend who was in our city was praying. It was National Day of Prayer. And uh, uh, I'm close my computer because I really am done. And um, uh, it was National Day of Prayer. And he calls me. I'm at the gym working out. And he says, hey, man, we're having this prayer thing, and I really think you should be there. I think there's going to be a lot of dignitaries and leaders there, and we're going to be praying for our city. And I'm like, man, we need to pray. We need to lock arms, and we need to be praying for our city. So I get there, and I come pray. And I get there. I still got, I got my basketball shorts on because I didn't think you had to be dressed up to pray. So I came to the church, and I look at everybody got their suits on and their nice ties. I'm like, yo, homie, why you didn't tell me this was a formal event? He's like, man, it's okay. Come on in. And so I'm sitting there, and it's getting ready to pray. And they got the music playing real softly in the background. And somebody stands up, and they, they start reading their prayer. The mayor is there. Everybody's in. I mean, just the whole city is in this room. And I'm like, yo, I thought we were going to pray. Somebody reads a prayer. And she read her prayer, and she sat down. Then somebody else got up, and they read their prayer. Like, man, I, I thought we were all going to pray. Now, I got no shade against somebody reading a prayer. Do that. That's fine. But then somebody else got up to read another prayer, and I'm like, yo, like, what is this? What did you call me for? And immediately, we hear the alarm starts going off. And the alarm is going crazy. But something amazing happened. Nobody moved. And I'm looking around like, yo, should we like be leaving right now? Because the alarm is literally going off. For five minutes, nobody moves until the youth pastor over in the corner stands up and says, hey, guys, this is not a drill. I think we should leave. And everybody gets up and they go outside. And we all circle up out front this church. We lock arms, and man, when we started praying, I believe the spirit of the living God began to fall. I don't know if there was a fire in the building, but there was a fire happening outside in that front lawn. As we began to look at each other, my brother, he didn't look like me. My sister didn't have the same clothes I had on, but I believe God had to break up that plastic moment and say, hey, would you guys go do what I've been asking you to do for a long time to be unified in this city and pray like crazy for everything else and trust me for the results? When we did that, the spirit of the living God fell. And I was excited to be a part of that moment. As I was driving home that day, I heard God say to me, this is not a drill. 
There are students leaving this earth. There are people that are hopeless. There are people that need to know about me. This is not a drill. Kingdom, can I share that with you tonight? This, this is not a drill. The core men in this church are going to change Morgantown. But this is not a drill. We have to commit our hearts to do this. We have to consecrate our hearts. We have to be like those people and say, Lord, is there anything that is in my life? Like, like David said, he says, Lord, I do not, you do not want sacrifice. What you do want is a broken spirit and a contrite heart. Then you will take my sacrifice. What is that that we need to put before the Lord tonight? What is it that we need to bring before him that might stop this mission? Is it unforgiveness? Is it the way we treat our spouses? Is it the way we treat each other? God says, no, I want you to be the example to a nation that is crying out to know who I am. This is not a drill. The body of Christ can no longer just go through the motions. We can no longer just be throwing up conferences to say, hey, let's train each other. No, there is a dying world out there that needs to see you and you and you and me. That God says, listen, this is not a drill. So here's what I want to do in this moment. Can we not let this just be another night of Bible study? Can we, can we stand and begin to pray for our city? Can we stand and begin to pray for the leaders of this church? Can we stand and begin to pray against the enemy that we would begin to begin to call out things, depression and anxiety? Right now in this moment, would you guys join me in saying, listen, we are going to commit the core, but this is not a drill and we're going to do it right now. Are you guys willing to do that? Let's stand right now. Here's what I want you to do. Get in twos and threes. Just where you at. Don't move all the rules. Just where you at. Just get in two and three and just begin to pray for this city. And I'm going to close us out, right? Let's just do that right now. Let's just begin to pray for this city. Let's begin to tell the enemy that we're going to be a nightmare to the kingdom of hell. Tonight, we are going to not just go through the motions. This is not a drill. Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray for our city. Let's pray for the work that we have to do tonight. Let's pray for the work that we're going to be doing in the upcoming weeks, God. Let's, this is not a drill. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. not a drill. God, the men in this room belong to you. Their hearts and their minds. This is not a drill. Come on, men, let's pray. Let's pray. Let's stand in the gap for our city. Let's intercede for the people of this community. Let's intercede for the lost, for the broken. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's plant our flag and we're not leaving. We're not moving. Hallelujah. Even in our own homes, we're going to plant our flag. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. But God, do it in me first. Some of us may need to commit to God right now. God, there's some things in my heart that I need to give to you. There's some pride. There's some lust. There's some things that I may be watching that I shouldn't be watching. God, I commit that to you right now. I want to come because I don't want anything to stop this movement. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God, take us out of our comfort zone. God, shake up our comfort zones because the Holy Spirit cannot comfort people who are already comfortable. God, shake us out of our comfort zones. This city needs this church. These young men need these men. Thank you, God. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. I pray for us now, God. I pray for this time. I pray for these men. God, as I look out over this room, God, I see a committed core. God, that is committed to the message. They're consecrated. Father God, they're committed to doing what you call for us to do, God, and we will not move. God, we're going to plant our flag, and God, we're going to stay, and God, we will not be moved. God, we're going to stand on your word. God, you said heaven and earth will pass away, but your word will stand forever, God. God, plant it in our hearts. God, put it, plant it in our hearts, God, that God, out of our mouths, God, would be the words of God. Out of our mouths would be the gospel. But God, we know it has power unto salvation. God, I come against anything that would bring division in this room. God, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that God, you would raise up a mighty men. God, that you would raise up this mighty core. That Father God, they would be locked in step. God, that they would be locked in unity. That God, that they would be an example to all around this city. And God, when people see them, they would take no glory for themselves, but they would give it back to you, God. Because only you deserve glory. Only you deserve honor. Only you deserve praise. And God, we thank you for that. And God, when it's all said and done, God, we're going to thank you. We're going to give you honor. We're going to give you glory. God, we are committing, we are bringing, we're confessing our sins to you. We're confessing that which we have held over you tonight. And we're saying, no more. God, you are first. God, you are priority. And we commit it tonight. Father God, I thank you for every man, every family that's represented in this room. I pray that there is no lack in their homes. I pray that there's no lack in their businesses because they serve your house. Bless their house because they serve your house. God, we thank you now. We honor you and we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's give God praise for the word. Thank you. Thank you so much.